Good morning everyone and welcome to week 8 of Graceful Living. This week we're going to take a slight break from using resources from our denomination because I want to spend some time talking about our belief in the communion of saints and life everlasting. So before we get into that, let us pray. O oh, Almighty God, who has knit together thine elect in one communion and fellowship, in the mystical body of thy Son, Christ our Lord, grant us grace so to follow thy blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those unspeakable joys which thou hast prepared for them that unfeignly love thee. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the midst of a global pandemic, we this week are going to be brave and bold and faithful and talk about death and the hope of resurrection. Um, we're going to be focusing a lot of our readings for this week on Revelation, which is perfect because apocalyptic literature is first and foremost about having hope. So we'll start with the introduction to Revelation. And I also have to confess this for those of you who don't know, Revelation is my favorite book in the Bible. So if at the end of this you have any questions, ask me. I will gladly, gladly, gladly answer them. Or just talk with you about apocalyptic literature. It is my jam. So... We'll start with the introduction. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom of priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So in the introduction, there's so much hope in there. And it's easy to lose sight of that, but it's there. And it's this hope in Jesus, hope in what God has done through Jesus. Christ is the firstborn of the dead, and we, who are freed from sin, have no reason to fear death. And I think that we lose sight of that when we get further into Revelation, and John starts telling us what he saw. But hold on to that it is about hope, and hope in resurrection. 
And I want to talk about these witnesses that come up in the readings. Uh, Revelation portrays them as a great multitude dressed in white, and they've come out of some sort of suffering. Now, modern heretical, and I really do mean heretical, interpretations argue that they're martyrs persecuted for their faith. That Left Behind series would say that they had their Bibles taken from them and that, you know, they survived the tribulation and all these terrible things happened, but they remained faithful. Now, there are quite a few problems with this interpretation. I'm going to lay out three of them briefly. The first is that Christian persecution didn't start on an empire-wide level until the third century. Um, Revelation was written sometime in the first century, so there's absolutely no way that this great multitude is made up of a bunch of Christians who have died for their faith. It's just not happening. Um, two, the Greek word that we translate as martyr doesn't mean someone who has died for their faith. That interpretation of that word would come later. It is really just someone who testifies and who witnesses. And in this case, these are Christians who have testified and who have witnessed to what they believe that Christ is the firstborn of the dead and everything else that we find in Revelation. And the third point is that it completely removes Revelation from its historical context. John is a bishop and the seven churches that he is writing to are the churches under his care. So this letter is no different than if we got a letter as a congregation or as a synod from Bishop Dunlop or as an entire denomination, a letter from Bishop Eben. That's all this is. It's a letter from a bishop to some congregations. Now, this letter is meant to inspire these churches to help them, to encourage them to confess faith in Jesus regardless of what their neighbors will think of them. So in Asia Minor, where these churches are located, we know that historically, this area was known for being excessively loyal to the Roman Empire, almost a cult-like following of the emperor. The emperor could do no wrong. Even when the emperor did wrong, the emperor was right. And so to go against that in any way would have cost you friendships and business deals and no one wants that to happen. But John says in this letter and throughout this letter, have faith, hold on, it's going to get better. Keep confessing because this is what I have seen. I have seen a new heaven and a new earth and you, you who are faithful, you who are freed from sin are a part of it. So at its core, Revelation is a book about having hope in the faith that we confess the faith that Christians have confessed for centuries. And it includes this belief in the communion of saints and life everlasting. And I think it's easy to lose sight of these things when we're in the midst of a global pandemic because yeah it's scary out there guys like I'm not gonna sugarcoat this um it's hard to have hope in resurrection hope that things will get better when things are so bad but isn't that the point of hope and the point of faith is that when things get bad, God continues to abide with us. The one who has gone before us abides with us and goes with us to the grave and beyond. And that is the hope of Christians and that is the hope 
in Revelation. And so as you read through the daily readings for this week, I'd encourage you to maybe make some extra time, if you have it, to read Revelation and think about the saints, not only of grace and in your life, but throughout time, throughout the life of the church. What does it mean for us to join the saints and the angels in their unending hymn? How can our faith in Jesus, the firstborn of the dead, give us hope during this time of pandemic? And where do you find hope in Revelation and in the confessions of the church? Now, for those of you who kind of know what's going on and have your thumb on the heartbeat of our congregation, you'll know that R3 has, since we started this process, been asking us as a congregation to share our faith moments or God wings, as Barb Anderson calls them, with one another. And so here is mine for All Saints. I was getting ready to start my final year of seminary. I had ordered my books and I was looking forward to a year of Greek and Latin and New Testament electives. Wasn't really looking forward to some required classes that I had to take to graduate. It was a Friday afternoon and I was getting ready for a relaxing weekend before the chaos of the semester set in. At some point that afternoon, I started seeing strange posts on Facebook from my family members. Something had happened, but I didn't know what. Um, I would learn a little bit later that my uncle Frank had died and I was floored. I asked what happened and I didn't get a response. Now, back in those days, and I know this is hard to believe, but back in those days, I was a runner. So I went for a run to calm down and it didn't work. Um, later that night, I learned that my uncle had taken his life, but no one would say how. Um, and I was told that we weren't talking about this as a family. And if anybody asked, he just died from natural causes. I was angry that this was the line that I was supposed to be towing. Because it wasn't true. We needed to talk about what had happened and we needed to grieve as a family. And my aunt had asked us to not do that. I learned the next day that my uncle had shot himself and we were still being asked to keep everything a secret. I didn't say anything, really. I called Carl crying but I didn't know a lot. I think I spent three hours pretty much crying curled up on the couch while he tried to calm me down. That was it. That was what happened. On Saturday, I went to the library and tried to pretend that everything was okay. I hung out with friends and put a smile on my face. I was trying to keep the party line of nothing happened, everything's fine, we're not talking about it. I went to Grace on Saturday night more so out of habit and less because it was where I wanted and needed to be. And I don't remember a lot of what happened that night, but I do remember that we sang around you, O oh Lord Jesus. And I sat in my seat, 
crying, trying my hardest not to completely fall apart in the chapel. At the end of service, Cindy Reif Snyder and Carol Dennis gave me big hugs, like they always did. And I knew that I'd be okay. Ladies, if you're watching this or reading this, thank you for those hugs. This week, I'd encourage you to listen to a recording of Around You, O oh Lord Jesus, and remember those who have gone before us, those who join that great cloud of witnesses, and those whom God has freed from sin. Amen.